your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. Everybody, clap your hands. This is the way we praise Him. Clap your hands. This is the way we praise Him. Clap your hands. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in him. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Truly what an awesome God we serve and he's worthy of our praises, not just some of the time, but indeed all of the time. Truly, I am grateful to have another opportunity to come before you at this time and to share with you another word from the Bible. I truly hope that this word will bless you uh, as much or more than it has blessed me. Our word will come from the prophetic book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. Beginning at verse 14, it reads as thus, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God? that shall deliver you out of my hands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. 
If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thou gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The title of this message will be, Will You Bow or Will You Stand? The title of this message is somewhat complicit with the times that we are living in because I think all of us will agree that we are living in some times when there are too many people falling for the wrong thing and not enough people standing for the right thing. Keep that thought in mind as we approach this narrative uh, in this text. The rhetoric of this narrative ushers us into a somewhat tense and tedious situation. King Nebuchadnezzar has summoned three Hebrew boys to come to a special meeting. This special meeting is in regards to their behavior towards a golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had recently had erected on the plain of Dura. The impetus for this statue, for this massive statue that stood some 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and overlaid with gold, the impetus for this is based upon a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter two. The dream so perplexed him and the dream so troubled him that Nebuchadnezzar was persuaded to call in what's known as his brain trust. He called in his musicians, his astrologers, his soothsayers, and the Chaldeans. He called them in to interpret his dream. We have to be careful in listening to the advice and the counseling of natural man. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5 says that our faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. These wise men came in and they asked Nebuchadnezzar to convey to them or share with them the contents of his dream. Nebuchadnezzar refused to do so. And had he shared with them what they was asking for, they still would not have been able to interpret, correctly interpret, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had. The reason why, because to interpret this dream would take more than natural wisdom. It would take divine sagacity to interpret this dream. You see these wise men, this wise council of King Nebuchadnezzar consisted of all natural men with natural wisdom. And the Bible cautions us about that because he says that the natural man receives not the things of God because they are foolishness to him and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So in order for Nebuchadnezzar to re, uh, get the correct and appropriate interpretation of his dream, he would need someone who had divine sagacity, someone who had a connection with the Almighty God. Nebuchadnezzar became so upset with these wise men that he hastily issued a decree for all of the wise men in his kingdom to be killed. The God that was to carry out this order was named Arioch. Daniel talked to Arioch and he persuaded Ar Arioch to allow him to have a private audience with the king. 
when Daniel went before King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel was said to him, if you give me several days, I will come back with the interpretation uh, of your dream. He granted him that. And when Daniel left the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar, he summoned his three prayer partners, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And I'm brothers and sisters, I'm grateful today that Daniel summoned his prayer partners because Daniel understood that in order for him to get the correct interpretation of this dream, he would need to have divine supernatural assistance. And we receive divine supernatural assistance through prayer. Oh, if men would only learn to pray before they enter into any enterprise, they would find out that they would have more success than failures. I think that the songwriter had this in mind when she penned the words to this song. She said, oh, what blessings we often forfeit and oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry not just some of the things, but everything to God in prayer. And then the apostle Paul says in Philippians 4 and 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving to let our requests be made known unto the Lord. After they had prayed, God answered Daniel's prayer. Daniel went, went back before King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel will tell him, now I'm ready to interpret your dream. Daniel will tell King Nebuchadnezzar in so many words that you dreamed of a statue that was in the shape of a man, a massive statue. And that this statue, statue was composed of five materials, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar that the head on this statue was made of gold. And this head represents you, King Nebuchadnezzar, because God has made you king of all kings on the earth. And the silver chest and the silver arms represent the Mede and Persian kingdom. This is the kingdom that will follow your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, which means that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom would not last forever, but that would be an ending. And then the bronze represented the Greece kingdom, the bronze abdomen and the thighs. Then the iron legs represented the Roman kingdom. And then the feet the iron feet mixed with clay represented the Roman kingdom being scattered and also being and also division being in that kingdom. And believe it or not, that is where we are at this time in history. We are at the foot of this statue where there is so much division. Never in the history of humanity has there been so much division nationally, internationally, globally, all over this world, there is division. It's at this time that Daniel says that a rock or a stone that was not hewed out by the hand of man, but this stone struck the foot of this statue and this statue crumbled until it became like chaff. And then this stone that destroyed this statue it grew into a mountain that filled up the entire world. And what Daniel will hear was prophesying to King Nebuchadnezzar is that all these kingdoms have a beginning and an ending, but then there's going to come a greater kingdom that's going to be an everlasting kingdom. And that kingdom will be the new world order. Yes, when Jesus comes again, He's going to usher into fruition a new world order. But King Nebuchadnezzar didn't hear anything 
or remember anything that Daniel said after he mentioned that the head on this human statue in his dream, the golden head represents him. And instead of him being grateful to God, he became uplifted in pride. We have to be careful and not become too uplifted in pride because God has a way of bringing us all down. Obadiah 4 says that though you ascend as high as the eagle and build your nest among the stars, the Lord says, yet will I bring you down. There is no kind of supremacy that is out of the reach of God's hand. David alludes to this when he asked the question in Psalms 139, beginning at verse seven, he says, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there shall thou hand lead me, and thou hand, right hand, shall uphold me. No one can get out of the hand reach of God. But Nebuchadnezzar became lifted up in pride so much so that he had this massive golden statue erected out on the plain of Dura. Again, this massive golden statue stood some 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. It was erected on the plain of Dura. Dura means house or residence. And what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to insinuate here was that since this statue was gold, he was saying that his kingdom would last forever. He was saying that his kingdom would be the kingdom in the world that everybody would have to look to and worship. And so this statue represented Nebuchadnezzar because when he mentions worshiping the statue, although he mentions uh, the other gods, but he also separates the statue from the other gods. And so when this statue was erected, he summoned all of the people in his kingdom that had power. He summoned the princes, he summoned the governors, the judges, the counselors, the treasurers, the sheriffs. He summoned all of the rulers of the various providences to come because he wanted to give this statue an inauguration. And he says to them, in the day, or in the hour, that you hear the sound of the coronet and of the flute and of the harp and of the sackbut, the psaltery, and of all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship this statue. And he said, if you don't do it, in the same hour, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, the music began to play. There were many nationalities around this statue, but there was one nationality in particular that people were looking at, and that was the children of Israel. You see, the children of Israel, they knew who the real God was. They knew who the real God is. But because of fear, Many of them bowed anyway. The music began to play and people began to bow, even to some of the children of Israel. But then there were three boys in the crowd, but they were not of the crowd. You see, children of God, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. The Apostle Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you are a child of God, it is your mindset that sets you apart from the world. You don't think like the world. You don't behave like the world. You don't conduct yourself like the world. 
So when every, everybody else was falling down, bowing down, these three boys chose to stand. And when they stood up, they stood out. And when you stand up and stand out, there are some people not going to be happy with that. When you take a stand for God, just get ready for some relationships to come to an end. Get ready for some trouble in some friendships, in some partnerships, in some fellowships. Get ready because people tend to get a little bit upset when you stand for the right thing. So they rushed back. Those who saw these three boys standing, these three Hebrew boys standing, they rushed back and told the king what they had witnessed. And the king was somewhat in a rage because he couldn't believe that these three boys, these three boys would be standing when he clearly told them that they should be bowing. You see, if you go back and check uh, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 49, these three boys was in good grace. They had a good relationship with the king, so much so that the king had placed them as rulers or as administrators over various providences. But when we come to Daniel chapter 3 and we get down to verse 19, the king's attitude had changed about these three boys. Let me say this. Man will change on you. The same man who smile at you today will frown at you on tomorrow. The same man who accepts you today will reject you on tomorrow. The same man who lift you up today will press you down on tomorrow. Man will change on you. But guess what? God will never change on you. Nebuchadnezzar asked these boys, said, is it true that you boys refuse to bow? He said, I tell you what. He said, we're going to play the music again. And if y'all just go ahead and bow down, Everything will be all right. It'll be well. We'll just forget about this whole incident ever happened. But if you don't bow down, boys, in the same hour, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And what God can deliver you out of my hand? Look how uplifted in pride that Nebuchadnezzar had gotten. For in chapter two, Daniel had just told him that God had installed him as king. And perhaps he had forgotten that the same God who installs you can uninstall you. The same God who lifts you up is the same God that can bring you down. And the same God who puts you in the same God that can bring you out. Nebuchadnezzar lifted up in pride, so much so that he even challenged God. What God can deliver you out of my hands? But you know what I like about these boys? They had no fear. For you see, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a strong mind, of a sound mind. We need to learn how to stand for God no matter what the situation may look like, no matter how dismal it may look, no matter how dark and dim it may look, you got to learn how to stand for him. If you stand for him, he will stand for you. These boys says to king, O oh, king, we are not careful in how we answer you in this matter. For you see, the God that we serve, <laughs> he's able. And king, I want you to know something. He's able to deliver us out of your hands and he will deliver us out of your hands. But in regards to this fiery furnace, if he decides not to deliver us from that, we still not gonna bow. We are not going to bow. These boys decided to stand. And the king became so angry and furious that he told them to heat the furnace seven times its natural temperature. Not just two times, not just three times, 
not just four times, five times, or six times, but seven times its natural temperature. But in the king, in his, in his haste, in his anger, he picked a number that was God's number. For you see, seven is God's number. God created this world in, in six days, and then on the seventh day, God rested. He sanctified that day. Naaman was told to go dip in Jordan seven times and his leprosy would be cleansed. Elijah prayed over the dead young lad and the lad sneezed seven times and then he came back awake. Jesus took two fish and five barley loaves, seven and fed 5,000 men besides women and children and took up 12 baskets of leftovers, seven. And then we hear John when he's out on the Isle of Patmos. John said, I looked and I saw seven golden candlesticks. And the one among those candlesticks looked like the son of man or the son of God. All seven is God's number. So he heated up seven times. It's natural temperature. And when he did that, he had his most mightiest soldiers, his most mightiest gods to take these three young boys <laughs> and to bind them. Now, they were not running, struggling, trying to get away, but the king was trying to send a message. He, tie, he had them bound. And then when they was bound after that, he had them to take them up to the furnace and to throw them into the furnace. And when these mighty men took Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and threw them into the fiery furnace. The Bible says that the flames were so hot that it came out and it destroyed those mighty men who threw Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did not die. You missed it. Isn't it strange how what kill other folk will not harm you? <laughs> Isn't it strange how uh, other people can be defeated and then you have victory in the same situation? Isn't it strange how what ties other people down, what take other people out, you just move right on through it as if it's not there? It's because you're covered by the Lord. You see, the children of Israel was able to come out of Egypt uh, without having to raise a sword or a spear because they was covered. That night when the death angel was in flight, every house that was covered by the blood, the angel passed over it. And that's the reason why the children of Israel came out of Egypt and didn't have any problem. And that's the reason why you having such a good time right now. Believe it or not, based on the time that other people are having, God is still blessing you. Some folks still struggling to buy gas, but you still go up there. You may argue about it, but you can still buy gasoline to go in your car. You may argue about groceries, but God is still providing groceries to put on your table. You may argue about your rent, may argue about your mortgage, but God is still providing the money for you to go ahead and take care of it. He's doing that because you are covered. These boys were thrown into the fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked over into the fiery furnace, he saw that the twine that they had used to bind these boys' hands, that this twine was burned off of their hands. They was walking around in the fiery furnace unbound. Oh, sometimes it takes the furnace to unbind us. <laughs> sometimes it takes the furnace, the fiery furnace, to set us loose. I hear Peter saying to us that we should not be worried about the fiery furnace. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that come to try us as if some strange thing happened to us. But Peter says, you ought to rejoice <laughs> in that you are partakers of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it takes the fire to make us and mold us and to shape us into what God desires us to be. I can remember when I was a lad of a young boy and I watched my mother, she would take a bowl out and she would take flour and put in that bowl. She'd take a couple of eggs and crack them and put them in that bowl. She'd put baking powder 
in that bowl. She put sugar in that bowl. She put milk in that bowl. She put vanilla flavoring in that bowl. And then she whoop it all up together. And we looked at that. We had no idea what that concoction was. But she put it in the pan. And mom would put the fart to it. She put it in the oven. <laughs> oh, and it was the fire that ultimately revealed the concoction that was in the pain. God has mixed us all up with some different things inside of all of us. All of us have some things that God has put in us. But we don't know what's really there until we've been tried in the furnace until fiery trials have come our way. And no matter how hot it gets, you don't have to worry about it because God is in control of the temperature. And God knows how to cook. <laughs> For he will not suffer you to be tempered above that that you are able. But with every temptation, he'll leave a way for you to escape out of it. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar looked over into the fiery furnace and to his chagrin, not only did he see three, but he saw a fourth figure walking around in the fiery furnace that was heated seven times its natural temperature. And these boys were showing no harm. And Nebuchadnezzar said, this fourth figure looked like the son of God. Isn't that good news to know that Jesus did not keep these boys from getting into the fiery furnace, but he got in the fiery furnace with them. <laughs> Somebody missed your shouting point there. The Lord may not prevent you from getting in trouble, but he'll get in the trouble with you. The Lord may not prevent you from getting into a travesty, but he'll get in the travesty with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Then King Nebuchadnezzar went down to the opening of the furnace and cried out, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, come here. These boys stepped out of the fiery furnace one by one. When they stepped out, all of these people who had gathered, including the king, they saw a miracle. They saw the mighty hand of God who had covered and protected these boys in a fiery situation. For their hair was not singed, their coat and clothes did not smell of smoke. They didn't have as much as a first degree burn because the Lord had covered them while it was in the furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked at him, Nebuchadnezzar said, I got to issue another decree. He says, your God is the only true and living God. He says, no God could do what this God has done today. And if anybody would blaspheme or say anything cruel about your God, he says, I will have them cut to pieces and their houses made into a dung hill. Look what happened. When these boys stepped out, the king's attitude was changed. And that's not all what happened. If you check verse 30 in chapter 3, it says there that King Nebuchadnezzar promoted Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. In other words, when these boys came through the fiery furnace, their blessing was waiting on them. Their blessing was not in the fiery furnace, but their blessing was through the fiery furnace. You got to go through it. And when you go through it, you can come out on the other side. And when you come out on the other side, God will have a blessing waiting on you. You can identify what the songwriter said when he said, look at me. I am a living testimony. I didn't make it on my own. And I'm not standing here all alone. It was Jesus that gave me uh, this opportunity. Look at me. I am a living testimony. God is able to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Uh, but you got to be willing to stand. You got to be willing to stand with your learned good about with the truth. Stand with the breastplate of righteousness on. 
Stand with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Stand with the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Stand with the helmet of salvation on your head. Stand with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, I got to close. I got to tell you one more thing. There's power in the word of God. There is deliverance in the word of God. There is a breakthrough in the word of God. There is joy in the word of God. There is peace. In the word of God. But you got to stand. So I want to close by asking you this question. Will you bow? Or will you stand? God bless you. Greetings. If you would like to give or offer donations to our church electronically, simply download the Givelify app via App Store if you have an iPhone or Google Play Store if you have an Android device. Next, search for the Greater New Prospect Baptist Church located at 1420 West Richmond Street, Needville, Texas 77461. It will have a purple logo on it as well as a green check mark to verify that it is a valid account. Next, you are to create an account and then begin your donations or make your offerings. Thank you, blessings. Additionally, you may also send donations to P.O. Box 525, Needville, Texas 77461. Members may continue link to contribute tithes and offerings to Greater New Prospect Church via Pony Mail or by visiting the campus between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. May God bless.